Good day and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your first speaker today, Jane Gerard, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Welcome to Tupperware Brands' second quarter 2021 earnings conference call. With me on today's call are Miguel Fernandez, our President and CEO, and Sandra Harris, our Chief Financial and Operations Officer. Earlier this morning, we issued a press release announcing our financial results for the second quarter into June 26, 2021. The press release is available on our company website on our investor relations page. We will begin with our safe harbor statement. During the course of today's call, we will make forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties as described in our press release and in our SEC filings. You should listen to today's call in the context of that information. We will also discuss some of our results for the quarter on a non-GAAP basis. Reconciliations between GAAP and non-GAAP measures can also be found in our press release. Any reference to sales in the discussion today is referring to local currency sales, which compares results between periods as if current period foreign exchange rates had been the exchange rates in the prior period. You can access the release and our forward-looking statement language through the Investor Relations section of the company website, where you can also access a webcast replay of this call later today. I will now turn the call over to Miguel for his remarks. Thank you, Jane, and good morning, everyone. We're now over 15 months into our three-year turnaround plan and we continue to make progress across many areas of the business. Our structure, capital structure, fixing our core direct selling business, and creating the ability to take our iconic brand into new channels of distribution. During the quarter, we continue to make the necessary investments that we believe will drive our future growth in both our current direct selling business and our business expansion efforts. We're adding new talent and investing in our core infrastructure such as marketing, sales, and support functions to evolve to a consumer-centric and omni-channel business. We right-sized the business and strengthen our balance sheet in 2020 to make the needed investments in 2021 that will enable us to accelerate growth in 2022. As we continue to attract new investors to our turnaround story, I would like to remind you of the key elements of our strategic growth plans that are well underway today. We're pivoting from a distributor push to a consumer pool and distributor push model. We're updating our brand architecture to allow us to segment branding, products, channels, and pricing to appeal to a broader consumer base while minimizing potential channel conflict. We're expanding into new product categories where consumers give us permission. We're aligning product development efforts to address the needs of all consumer social sub-segments. We're expanding distribution and access points to meet consumers where they shop. And most importantly, we're continuing to fix the core direct selling business with proven methods. The top of our brand is iconic. We have been around for 75 years, and that is for one primary reason. Our products have been loved and trusted in homes around the world for generations. We're making new investments to build an omnichannel business, one that grows our direct selling channel provides new consumers new ways to access our products and gives our brand a bigger platform to nurture a better future every day. Let me first provide you with the progress we've made in modernizing our core direct selling business. Over the last year, we have implemented a suite of tools to enable our sales force to reach their, their customers in new and more efficient ways. And honestly, it's all about virtualizing our sales force journey by looking at the experience from end to end and delivering the right technologies for our sales force to start, grow, and sustain their businesses. Our most advanced digital tool is called Top Social, and it makes it easy for our sales force to grab and share social media content to better market their businesses and product offerings. 
We have now expanded this technology into 23 markets, with two more planned for later this year. We're also rolling out technology tools like Tupperware Live, formerly called VTOP, that enables our Salesforce to host virtual parties, and it allows their customers to purchase in the moment. We have launched this in 12 markets so far, with five more countries coming online by year on end. Our most re recent technology addition is an onboarding tool. It helps to drive retention and performance, where our consultants can find resources for communication, as well as continuing education and training. It has been launched in two key markets so far, with five more upcoming by the end of 2021. Additionally, we now have e-commerce direct-to-consumer functionality available in 13 markets. Now, let me turn to our business expansion whose sales are 18% of year-to-date revenue and include distribution channels such as business-to-business -business loyalty programs, sustainability, specialty retail such as QVC, importers, and retail studios in China, Korea, and Vietnam. Our efforts to dramatically expand this business is rooted in our brand strategy to build a branded house. We believe creating sub-brands such as Tupperware Essentials and Tupperware Pro Chef will allow us to develop the right product mix, the right pricing, and expand into new channels of distribution while minimizing channel conflict. Let me explain a bit more about our business expansion and drill down on some specific around more developed pillars. Our B2B relationships support loyalty programs of major retailers while improving our brand presence. We're making good progress developing more relationships with large retailers in Brazil, Mexico, and Europe. Our B2B sales have historically been between 30 and 35 million annually, and we expect this to be over 50 million this year. Another important part of the business expansion strategy is moving into new markets through an important model whereby we don't have physical business presence. Rather, we sell Tupperware branded products into markets through an agreement with an important distributor. These products are being distributed through direct selling and in some cases through omni-channel strategies. Prior to this quarter, we sold into 18 markets through this model. Beginning in the third quarter, we opened two new important markets, Honduras and Panama. We hope to finalize an agreement to open a very promising market, the UK, before the end of the year. These important markets are strategically important and provide incremental profitability. In this quarter, we saw the best profitability in the last 10 years, specifically in the important markets. In the sustainability pillar, we're now selling our limited edition national park themed product as part of our partnership here in the US. The product line includes products intended to be taken on the go to help reduce waste in the parks. A number of national park themed products are made with our EcoPlus material, which is made with innovative sustainable materials using mixed plastic or renewable recycled materials. These products can also be found for sale at some national parks across the country for a limited time. Now, let me provide a product update. As you know, product innovation is important to us to meet and address the needs of all consumers' social sub-segments, and we are making some good progress in this area. For the second quarter, the percentage of sales for new products in Mexico was 11.6%, up 52% from prior year's second quarter. Brazil new products contributed 8.3% of sales, up 41%, and US and Canada contributed 3.8%, which is 38% higher than last year. Our largest product category continues to be food conservation at 27.5% of sales, and it is 17% higher than last year, followed by entertain category at 16% of sales, up 18%. Kitchen preparation is about flat versus last year at 15.2%, and on-the-go category is 13.2% of our revenue and was down slightly versus last year. I would also like to, to give a brief update on our ESG, environmental, social, and governance strategy. We have made great strides in the, in the last quarter to refine our ESG goals, including uh, aligning that with our employees' performance objectives. We have developed an internal cross-functional working group together with the support of our board of directors to take our ESG efforts to the next level. Our goal is honing on our sustainability focus, social impact, and governance efforts 
to align our brand purpose to nurture a better future every day. As our work in this area progresses, I look forward to sharing more on our long-term ESG targets, social impact initiatives, and training and education in this area. Looking to the next few quarters, our key priorities in 2021 are the following. First, to strengthen our direct selling business in the areas of digital and product investment, segmentation of our sales force, introducing preferred customer loyalty programs around the world, use of data to identify best practices, use of data to upsell and cross-sell to our preferred customers, and to ensure competitive service and cost. And in the business expansion, our priorities are the following to explore new channels of distribution, avoiding a potential conflict with our current direct selling channel, introduce top sub subbrands, and penetrate into different product categories where we know the consumer give us permission to enter. We believe the execution of these priorities is building a strong foundation that will create meaningful value for our shareholders for years to come. Let me now turn the call over to Sandra Harris, our CFO and COO, for a review of our financial statement. Thanks, Miguel. Second quarter sales were $465 million, reflecting an increase of 17% compared to last year on a reported basis. Growth in the quarter was benefited by about 7% from more favorable FX rates compared to a year ago. Our performance in the second quarter marks the fourth consecutive quarter of double-digit growth since the beginning of our turnaround plan, a strong proof point that our strategy is working further supporting our confidence in the large growth opportunity that lies ahead for Tupperware. From a geographic perspective, growth was driven by our largest markets. U.S. and Canada, Mexico, and Brazil contributed more than 80% of the dollar increase driven by the improvements we are making to build a stronger core direct selling business in addition to our continued investments to support our expansion into new channels. Some highlights in the area of business expansion. B2B sales were 15 million, or 3% of our revenue for Q2, and our importer market increased more than 50% in the quarter. As Miguel mentioned, business expansion is about 18% of our total sales, with both B2B and importer markets representing a significant growth opportunity for Tupperware brands and represents key growth pillars of our long-term strategy. Turning now to the revenue performance in the regions, North America increased 17%. Tupperware Mexico sales increased more than 20%, driven by 36% growth in average active sales force, partially offset by a 9% decline in productivity. The strong performance was driven by a combination of more effective utilization of data and analytics, a key strategic priority for us, new merchandising and promotional strategies, product innovation, and increased Salesforce adoption of digital tools, specifically social media. We're implementing personalized websites for our Salesforce in Mexico to make it easier for them to sell and place orders, which we believe will drive higher Salesforce productivity over time. In the U.S. and Canada, sales increased 12% as a 20% increase in productivity was partially offset by a 6% decrease in the average active Salesforce. In Europe, Sales increased 17%. The major contributor to growth for the quarter were B2B loyalty programs up 16% in the quarter, with major retailers in Germany, Austria, and in our Central Eastern Europe group. South America increased almost 50%, driven predominantly by Brazil, where sales increased more than 35%. A 22% increase in Salesforce activity combined with a 12% increase in productivity drove the results for the quarter. While COVID continues to negatively impact our recruitment efforts in Brazil, we are deploying retention strategies and targets in an effort to incentivize our Salesforce in that region. Looking forward, we're evolving our e-commerce strategy in Brazil as we become more consumer-centric in our approach, as well as initiating a B2B loyalty program. These initiatives will help support a constructive growth outlook for this important market as we head into 2022. Asia was flat excluding China. Including China, the region was down 14% compared to last year, including a more than 30% decline in China primarily as a result of studio closings and a slower pace of new openings. 
While disappointed with the ongoing weakness, we continue to believe China holds great potential for the Tupperware brand long term. While in the midst of a leadership change for this important growth market, the local team is working to update the look and feel of the retail studios to help create a more competitive franchise in the marketplace. In China, we will begin to elevate our brand and product segmentation strategy to expand into new channels such as e-commerce and develop flagship studios in mall locations. These efforts will be supported by a strong product innovation pipeline to ensure the studio owners have relevant products with competitive pricing. Once again, we're pleased with the fourth consecutive quarter of revenue growth. And now we'll turn to profits, where you will continue to see the efforts of our turnaround plan. Gross margin was 68.3%, or 200 basis points higher than a year ago, driven by the carry-in of 2020 inventory at lower cost, combined with the favorable impact of higher volume in our manufacturing plants. Looking forward to the second half, we do expect higher product costs versus a year ago, primarily as a result of higher resin and logistics. However, our turnaround plant efforts will continue to drive efficiencies through the supply chain, and when coupled with the impact of price increases, we believe we can largely neutralize the overall impact. SG&A is a percentage of sales of 50.1%, which benefited by a favorable tax ruling in Brazil that resulted in a reversal of a prior year operating tax reserve of 10 million. Adjusting for that one-time non-recurring item, adjusted SG&A as a percentage of sales would have been 52.2% of sales, or 140 basis points higher than last year. The increase reflects the 120 basis points of higher freight cost, primarily in the U.S., and the incremental investment cost that we discussed last quarter. Of these investments, a portion comes from the add back of 25% of $193 million in gross turnaround savings we reported in 2020 that were largely associated with COVID-19 actions. As we previously communicated, the majority of new investments related to the acceleration of tax planning strategy, IT infrastructure, and digital investments will be in the back half of this year, along with expense timing differences shifted from the second quarter to the third. In regard to the higher freight costs, we're experiencing the increased cost from carriers associated with the higher demand, as well as FedEx surcharges that have yet to be lifted. However, we are also seeing a shift in our business model in the U.S. In an effort to grow sales and offset the physical limitations related to COVID-19, we began shipping direct to the end consumer versus using our sales force for distribution and order fulfillment. This resulted in more packages as our units per carton decreased from over four per carton to one and a half per carton. As we shift to a more omni-channel approach, we expect this trend to continue and we'll be working on ways to optimize and improve efficiencies in this area. For the second quarter, the improvements in gross profit and the one-time Brazil tax reserve reversal of 10 million contributed to an adjusted operating income of 85.8 million or 18.5% of sales. Allow me briefly to touch on adjusted EBITDA as I know it's a metric that's important to many of our investors as we continue to delever the business and evolve the capital structure. The trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA at the end of June was 377 million versus last year of 214 million. This improvement of 163 million reflects the results of the right sizing and focus on stabilizing our core business as part of our turnaround plan. Now let's review EPS on an adjusted basis for the second quarter. Adjusted EPS was 95 cents compared to 84 cents last year. We did benefit from the Brazil tax reversal already mentioned by 13 cents at the 2021 operating tax rate. The divestiture of average lane early in 2021 negatively impacted EPS by two cents. Profit from higher sales were offset by a portion of the turnaround plan savings add back and also by a shift from higher profit markets such as China to lower profit markets like the U.S. and Canada. In our press release is a reconciliation of EPS, and you can see that the gap EPS was largely impacted by prior year one-time items associated with the early extinguishment of the debt and the Australian property sales in the prior year. 
cash flow for the quarter with $6 million versus $102 million last year. Higher cash flow in the prior year was due to aggressive turnaround plan saving actions, including COVID-specific actions like furloughs, and our intense focus on liquidity through preservation of cash by lowering spending on inventory and higher payables. In the current year, we're investing in inventory to improve our service levels and prepare for increased demand while we are also returning to a more normal capital spending level as previously communicated. In the second quarter, our total debt balance was $644 million, reflecting a reduction of nearly $160 million from the $804 million in the second quarter of last year, which includes a recent debt prepayment on our term loans, which we announced earlier in the quarter. The debt reduction, together with the improvement in EBITDA, resulted in a debt-to-adjusted EBITDA ratio for debt covenant purposes of 2.05 versus 4.91 last year, and well below the required covenant of 3.75. While we recently announced that our board approved a new share repurchase program of $250 million, it was approved and announced during a self-imposed blackout period, so no repurchases have occurred to date. Turning quickly to an administrative matter, I'd like to take a few minutes and touch on the disclosure in our press release this morning with regard to our intent to file a 10-K-A amended annual report for fiscal year 2020. In summary, from a quantitative perspective, I want to emphasize that no restatement of the previously issued financial statements is required. The only change to the consolidated financial statements will be to amend the out-of-period corrections footnote to disclose a $4.5 million understatement in net income in 2020 and a total of $4.5 million in overstatements in net income from the prior years. As a reminder, in 2019, the company made adjustments related to its fuller business and in 2020 disclosed a material weakness in internal controls over financial reporting related to Tupperware Mexico. As a result of our cooperation with an ongoing SEC inquiry related to these matters, we determined that in hindsight, the accounting positions presented in the historical periods required adjustments. We believe there will be no impact to our 2021 results, go forward plans, or overall financial position as a result of these adjustments. And lastly, as part of our turnaround plan, our current leadership team is committed to continuing to make the appropriate investments and improvements across the organization, including governance and compliance. This leadership team and our board take our responsibilities in these areas very seriously. While our investments in these areas are ongoing and foundational to the integrity of our strategic growth plan, I am pleased with our progress and confident in our ability to stand up a world-class organization. Before I turn the call over for Q&A, I'd like to announce a new member of our executive team. Joe Eilkar joined us on Monday as the Executive Vice President of Finance and Corporate Strategy. He joins us from VF Corporation, which is a consumer-focused company with a diverse portfolio of iconic global lifestyle brands, where he served in a number of corporate finance leadership roles. Bringing Joe onto the team is in line with our focus to build our business and our leadership team to match the power and reach of our iconic global brand. I have worked with Joe in the past and I'm confident he has the right skill set to continue building a high-performing team and strong financial culture to support our turnaround plan. He will oversee the company's corporate strategy as well as some global finance functions including financial planning and analysis, investor relations, corporate development, business data analytics, and treasury. We look forward to his partnership as we continue to execute the turnaround plan, drive our strategy, and deliver strong returns to our shareholders and stakeholders. In summary, achieving a double-digit growth for the fourth consecutive quarter, delivering profits that continue to reflect our right-sizing efforts, and lowering our debt through the proceeds of non-core asset sales and improving our EBITDA resulting in a leverage ratio of 2.05 are all further evidence that our turnaround plan is working. As we look forward to the rest of the year, we're investing in initiatives we believe will drive penetration and growth into new channels. We believe these actions and our strategic plans will create a stronger, more competitive company for the future. I will now turn the call over for Q&A.
As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Again, that is star 1 on your telephone. However, if your question has been answered and you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question is from Wendy Nicholson with City. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Um, I had a couple questions. First of all, um, just sort of a housekeeping item. I think you called out food conservation as 27% of your sales. And I'm wondering, Miguel, maybe if you have a long-term target or as you focus on innovation, which I think is such an important part of the story, um, do you have a target for what that will be um, over time? Hi, Wendy. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, we don't we don't have targets in terms of percentage of the of the company sales, because we believe that we can enter into more categories. So even if this food conservation category keeps on growing, we expect to have even more growth from other new categories that we enter into. Okay, fair enough. And then my second question is just on your target. I mean, it sounds like you're making good progress on the omni-channel development and expansion into new, new, whatever distribution channels. Um, but again, same thing. I know you've set this goal of 50% of the sales coming from non-direct selling channels. Again, kind of the progress that you're making. You know, how far out is that 50%? And are you beginning to get any feedback from your Distributors, how 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 they're viewing those actions? Yeah. So so as you know, this is uh, this is a completely new muscle for the company. This is something that we have never done, right? So so we're making good progress in more more so in our bigger markets because the level of management that we have in those markets allow us to do more things. Uh, the the one very positive thing is that every time we touch any channel. Uh, the response that we've gotten is uh, very positive. So that means that the brand is, as we expected, uh, very strong, and uh, there's a lot of people that want to work with us. So that's very positive. Uh, we're, in, we're, building, we're building the skill set, but also we're engaging with people that do that for their living. You know, there's companies that can help us, you know, open up doors and, and, and build that, that muscle, you know, uh, for us in the in the meantime. So in terms of when we're going to get to the 50%, obviously it's hard to tell, but my goal would be in about three years, we're going to be very close to that number. Um, and obviously it's going to be driven by the bigger markets for us because that's, that's when we're going to be, uh, I guess, moving the needle. But uh, every day is a learning experience for us. But what I can share with you also is that we already have a marketing organization that is um, structure and design around our sub-brands, and as you know, we're going with our sub-brands to all these different channels. The first two that we're going into is Topper Essentials. As you can see by the name, this is where we're going to be a lot more price competitive. And, uh, and we're also going with our Pro Series, Pro Chef Series, which is um, pre it's a premium brand where we might go with specialty stores uh, and, very, you know, targeting, you know, professionals in, in the kitchen. So so now some parts of a company start looking at a CPG company more so than, than a typical direct selling company. Fair enough. Okay, sounds great. And then my last question maybe for you, Sandra, is obviously, you know, the top line growth year to date has been fantastic. Um, but we hit a really tough comp all of a sudden here in the third quarter. And I know you don't want to give us too much guidance um, but but can you give us any directional guidance? Are, are we talking, you know, sales growth in the third quarter potentially down mid-single digits, down double digits, just maybe anything you're seeing here, you know, third quarter to date, just so that we can kind of frame the likely outcome so there isn't an unpleasant surprise when we get to the end of the third quarter? Yeah, Wendy, I'll just reiterate that, uh, what we said in the past, that as we get into the second half, the comps become much tougher. So just to remind everybody, we were up 21% Q3 last year and 20% in Q4. So um, you know, as we enter into those, it'll, the comps will be much, much more difficult. Um, you know, as we, I think you heard from the script today, we continue our efforts in both areas, right, our direct um, core selling business as well as our business expansion. And so, um, you know, the theme of, of what we talked about today is what we truly believe in on the turnaround plan, that we have a growth platform. 
Um, so obviously harder comps. Uh, you know, don't think we can necessarily say double digit growth as we go forward, but we're doing everything around both of our businesses to ensure that we do have a growth platform and that we're deploying the right uh, skills, we're investing in the right tools to, to really drive growth in both of those areas. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Your next question is from Linda Walton Weiser with DA Davidson. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I was kind of wondering if you could um, explain a little bit more about this import, direct import program you talked about. Um, just exactly what is that? And once the product is imported into a market, who who are you? Is it being distributed and sold through your sales force, or are you just products going into other channels and to regular retailers? Thanks. So, uh, hi Linda, this is Miguel. Uh, good morning. So, so the model is very simple. Uh, we have two options, right? Let's say smaller country. I'm going to put Honduras because this is one that we're we just opened. So, we have two options. One is to set up an office, hire management, and have all those costs. And, you know, obviously because the, the business at the beginning is very small, you know, we would be losing money and it would be, you know, I'm going to call it painful to set up a whole office, train people and get it. The other option, which is our important model, is to reach, to reach out to, uh, it could be a family, a big, you know, a wealthy family or a business family in, the, in Honduras, or it could be another, you know, business, bigger business that is already settled there. And we get into agreement with them to, you know, to sell them the product. Uh, we support them with marketing materials, obviously with the product, with the latest innovation. And, uh, and sometimes we deliver the product to the port or sometimes they come and pick it up wherever we want or we agree. And we just give it to them. We, we suggest how to go to market in direct selling, but we also give them the freedom if they have their own contacts, you know, to go to retail in Honduras or e-commerce, whatever they want to do. Obviously, they need to, you know, to be in, under the limits of our brand strategy, obviously following our, you know, policies, procedures, and so on. And then for us, it's from one day to another one to get access to all these channels, to higher level of management, and, uh, and off we go. We start making profit from the, from the first day. Uh, we have uh, close to 20 markets right now, and we expect to have a few more in the next uh, in the next year, and the biggest one that we're working us uh, on is the UK, as, as we mentioned in the in the call. So, so just so I understand, for a big market like the UK, you you would still allow them the freedom to distribute or sell as they saw fit, you know, with the support of the corporation behind it. Exactly, exactly. Actually, in the UK, I think we're going to go retail first, uh, and then probably, you know, probably direct selling. If we go in direct selling, it would be the last one, but uh, it's going to be retail first or direct to consumer probably through, you know, TV channels and, you know, like QVC type and things, things like that. But I think direct selling is going to be the last channel going into the UK. Okay, great. And then um, can you talk about um, the pricing that you've implemented so far? Is it on kind of like everything, or are you implementing it more through the new product innovation you mentioned? And at what point will, like, the pricing be kind of fully implemented so it can be offsetting your, your inflation? So, so, Linda, as you know, it's a lot easier to increase prices in your products, right, because there's no comparison. But even with that, in some key products, we're making, uh, you know, progress in the pricing. Also, you should know that we expect the resin price to come a little bit down for next year. So we don't want to overprice or price ourselves out of the market. So this is where it gets a little bit as, as you know, it's science and art, right? And, and we're, we're making very, you know, detailed analysis on a product by product basis. And, and the other important thing is that, as you know, our distributors and our sales force, they get 25, 30s and 35% discounts. So we can work with them to, temporarily, instead of making 25%, they can make 23 or 22, so they can adjust their own pricing in their single transactions, so the consumer doesn't feel it, and they still make, you know, they still have a business, probably not as profitable, and this is where direct selling is very, you know, it's very helpful to us, because 
the fact that we price up or doesn't mean that they need to price up for the you know to the consumer. They can be a buffer a buffer between us and and the consumer. So in some cases we we work with them to ask them to become that buffer. Okay. And then um in terms of the 40 to 45 million of incremental spending that you had talked about for this year, I didn't quite catch if you had quantified how much of that was in um, both the quarter and the first half. Yeah, we didn't specifically quantify it. The majority of that will come in the, the later half. We did do some um, spending as we continue to accelerate our tax planning strategy in Q2, um, but the majority of that incremental investment is related to further IT infrastructure investments um, that will occur more in the back half of the year. Okay. And um, can you talk about um, – China just a little bit, because I know you're in the process of, you know, kind of working on that business, but it seemed to me that before you were talking about, like, even the number of studios, like, growing, and you said the studios are kind of more closing in China. Why, why are they closing, and what can you do to kind of change that, or do you want the number to, to be reduced somewhat? So, so, Linda, you know, obviously China is the biggest question, right? Uh, as you know, we're living under very difficult circumstances, so we haven't been able to go physically to China, so, so that makes it a little bit more difficult for us. But the, the short answer is product. Uh, if, you, if you ask me, the product innovation that we've had in, in China in the last several years has been uh, less, than, less than ideal. We've relied in three to seven products, and that's all that uh, we've sold for many years. And, uh, and now I think the market is, is you know, is reacting to that. So uh, there's a lot of investment become, behind product. As you know, it takes some time to bring product into the market. So we, we think in, in the next two or three quarters, we're going to bring a lot of innovation to, mar um, to the market. Once you have a good, uh, good product that is uh, demanded by the Chinese consumer, then the whole equation shifts. You know, it's a lot easier to, to you know, to keep your studios open, even to grow the number of studios, but also one of the big shifts that we're, we're, we're making is that a lot of the studios that they are closing down right now, they're what we call neighborhood studios, studios where they're not in um, high traffic areas. Also the image that we have in some of them is not the one that we really want for our brand. So we are, uh, we are pretty much investing a lot of uh, effort and time in, in coming up with a ideal studios, you know, physical, you know, locations, how they should look, how you should feel them. You know, it's, they're going to be looking a lot more professional. Within combination of a good product, uh, we hope this uh, not only to increase the number of studios, but also to their productivity to be way, way higher. And that, uh, and that is pretty much the key of the first stage of our, of our priorities. The second one is it's obviously e-commerce. Uh, and then, you know, and that also relates to product. There were some products that we used to sell in the past that were not, I'm going to call it e-commerce ideal, but now the whole new product portfolio and innovation is going to be, you know, I think we're going to be able to sell it on e-commerce, and that's the, that's the other big area of investment for us. So, you know, China is, is the one market that I think is going to take us, you know, more time to, to fix and turn around. And as you know, we're making another shift in um, in leadership, and uh, and we'll keep you updated with all that you know all the progress there. But this is this is where I spend a lot of my time. Sandra, Hector, we we're all you know everyone is you know focused on China and how we turn around China. Okay, thank you. And then since we're on the topic of Asia. Just if you exclude the China, you had said Asia was flattish um, in the rest of Asia. So what's going on with those other markets? I guess my impression was they were growing a little bit better. Have they just slowed or are there COVID impacts or kind of yeah. what's going on yeah. in the rest of Asia? Yeah, you got it. It's COVID. You know, I, I think we would have been a, a lot better. We would have shown a lot better numbers without COVID. I think one of our biggest contributors, Malaysia, uh, you know, it's a full in, you know, it's in full lockdown. We also have uh, new management teams pretty much 
in every single country in in APAC, and uh, and we're making good progress. We're you know all the indicators that we you know that are leading indicators they are looking much better. But COVID was one of those bumps in the in the road that we were not obviously we thought we were going to be out of COVID by now. But you know some of those countries it's like deja vu. You know it's like it feels like a year ago. So um, so here we go again. Okay. And then just finally, um, in Europe, you're actually producing pretty strong growth there. Um, can you just kind of talk about, like, what are the drivers there going on in Europe? So it's a, it's a basic uh, direct selling uh, methods and techniques that you, that you know that, uh, that we develop and that we are mastering. You know, it's, it's eliminating sales that are non-profitable. And everything starts with service, with, with good product, training, giving tools to the sales force, making sure that we, we stay close to the leaders, talk to them, see which are their pain points, uh, the ABC of direct selling. And we're also making some progress in our B2B business. If our B2B business in Europe is the one that is the most developed. So, uh, so things are, you know, are getting better and better in, in Europe, and I think they're going to continue to be even better once South Africa – Comes comes back from you know all the issues that uh, the country is dealing with. Okay, great. And then just finally, can I ask about um, on your share repurchase program? You said you hadn't done any yet. Is your approach to that sort of strictly opportunistic, or do you anticipate um, a regularity in your share repurchase activity? Yeah, so, you know, Linda, what I would say is that we, we obviously have the full board support on the 250, and it shows the confidence they have in that type of program. You know, our liquidity situation has definitely improved. But we do have certain, you know, leverage goals and internal criteria that we'll follow to provide the right framework for making these repurchases. And it will be, you know, basically a business decision based upon those criteria, our cash flow, and the best use of our, you know, capital. Um, and, and if that's the best use, then we'll proceed forward with it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. And I am showing no further questions at this time. That concludes the Q&A session. I will now turn the call back to President and CEO Miguel Fernandez for closing remarks. Thank you. I am pleased with the continued results of our turnaround as we make progress across many areas of the business. Cost structure, capital structure, fixing our core direct selling business, and creating the ability to take our iconic brand into new channels of distribution. We believe we are well on our way to a successful execution of our three-year turnaround plan, and we're shifting our time and resources from stabilize to growth, with the implementation of our growth strategies to become a more consumer-centric company. Thank you for your time today. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. Have a great day. Stay safe and well.